Welcome back to Education Talks. I'm David Burke. Mingye Choi is a solutions engineer at Instructure with a broad range of experience working with education and training institutions across Asia. Previously, she was with Singapore's Ministry of Education as a chemistry teacher and later in the Educational Technology Division, driving projects to improve digital learning. I was interested to catch up with Ming to learn about her experience transitioning from the classroom to working in EdTech. Hi Ming, welcome to Education Talks. Hi Dave, thank you for having me. Absolute pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have you on the program. Where are you joining us from? I'm joining from Singapore, which is a tropical island country next to the equator in Southeast Asia. We have all year round summer, we have amazing food and uh, one of the best airports and airlines in the world. One of my most favorite places in the world, Singapore. I called it home for a couple of years and uh, actually visiting very soon. So looking forward to that. Um, have you always lived in Singapore? Uh, I've not. So I was born in China. I was then raised in Singapore and then I went to university in London. Uh, somewhere in between that, I've also lived briefly in the Netherlands and now I'm back home here in Singapore. Oh, very good. Um, would you be able to give us a little bit of a, an overview of your career? Tell us about your background and why you decided originally to become a teacher. Yeah, absolutely. So it probably started when I was in high school. We call it junior college here, when there was a bunch of uh, government ministries or agencies that came to my school to pitch their organizations and recruit young talents. So I remember particularly being drawn to the talks from a Ministry of Education. And I also remember thinking to myself that, you know, yeah, teaching sounds like very interesting and very fulfilling. And I want to give that a try. So I did exactly that. After A-levels, I went and did an internship and relief teach to relief teach in a junior college. And I absolutely loved every minute of it. And that's when I decided, yep, this is what I want to do. So fortunately enough, I was able to get a full scholarship from the Ministry of Education, which had not only allowed me to pursue a university degree in London, but also a career in teaching upon graduation. Fantastic. And you became a chemistry teacher. I did. I did. So I really enjoyed the experience. I taught chemistry in a local secondary school. My students were teenagers aged between 13 to 17. Um, I'm not going to lie. Teenagers are not the easiest group of people to work with every day. Um, but having said that, that's also what makes the job very exciting. So I think kids at that age, they have so much going on in their lives. They are just starting to discover their personal identity. Some of them come to school with huge baggage from their homes. Some may also face relationship challenges with their friends. And while all of these are going on in their world, they are expected to sit in a classroom and learn. And so just imagine how hard it is for a 13 year old to do that. So I think they really look at teachers as not just the person to impart knowledge from textbooks and really the role or maybe I should say the roles of teachers encompass a lot more complexity, which can include being, you know, providing that mentorship or equipping our students with the essential life skills or soft skills and sound values that they can carry with them when they leave the classroom. So you worked as a chemistry teacher for a while, but then you made a bit of a change. You worked for the Ministry of Education in a broader role. Uh, can you tell us about that? And it was also interesting timing when it happened. Can you tell us what that next position was? Yeah, it was a very interesting time indeed. So I started with the Ministry of Education in the Educational Technology Division in January 2020. And mm -hmm. like Dave, you mentioned, 2020 is a very interesting time. Uh, well, put it positively, interesting timing for all of us. Um, I still remember booking a holiday mid-January that year when COVID wasn't really a thing in the region. And a few days later, when I was at the airport for that trip, Singapore had its first case and everyone was frantically queuing up and buying N95 masks at an airport pharmacy. And of course, being the FOMO I am, I was part of that long queue. <laughs> but when I got back from the trip, it was a whole new world that we were living in. Uh, just from the education perspective, 
home-based learning used to be just a once or maybe twice a school term thing. And now teachers had to scramble to get their resources online. I mean, the last time we had schools shut down was nearly 10 years ago during SARS. So I think it was only natural that we were not quite fully prepared for a situation as such. Um, but having said that, I think it was especially helpful that I was working at a headquarter at a time because I saw firsthand the challenges the schools were facing and as well as how MOE took measures promptly to support our teachers and students. Uh, for example, MOE loaned out uh, internet devices to students who may not have access to one at home. Uh, it also opened up schools even during the lockdown period to provide students with a safe space to continue their learning. So I think personally, uh, one of my biggest takeaways during my stint at the headquarter is that while the pandemic has definitely expedited adoption of technology in the education space, um, Perhaps more importantly, it has also surfaced some of the gaps that need to be addressed before any transformational change can happen. So that was a period of great transformation. And then you've transformed even further, uh, stepping beyond Singapore. You are now a solutions engineer with Canvas uh, by Instructure. Uh, can you tell us what's involved with that role? Absolutely. So just to give our listeners a bit of context, uh, Canvas is a learning management system that benefits millions of users around the world. We have more than 6,000 customers globally, including all the Ivy League schools. So we do have customers across different industry and sectors from K-12 schools to higher education institutions to corporate training, adult training organizations. So my role as a solutions engineer, uh, I provide the technical expertise throughout a sales cycle. I partner closely with the sales team to align the client's technical requirements to business outcomes. And solutions engineer generally have a deep understanding and knowledge of the products or the platform we're selling. So upon um, understanding this business and technical requirements, I then go back and design and present these um, customer solutions that addresses these needs. Now, uh, it must be very valuable, um, your education, your teaching background uh, for the company. Can you um, perhaps reflect just briefly on that? I mean, that must give you a great insight uh, into, uh, I guess, the expertise that you're providing? Definitely. Um, I would say, so in my day-to-day -day job, I do speak to stakeholders from a wide variety of backgrounds. So including C-level executives of an organization or chancellor of a university, the business and the finance team, um, IT or LMS administrators, or sometimes instruction designers. So as you can see, not all of them come from a technical background. So during each demo or each presentation, it is also crucial for me to translate these complex business challenges together with our proposed solution to a language that is easily understandable by these audiences that come from different specializations. And I think if you do speak to different solutions engineers, they may tell you their favorite or best strategies at this. And I'm going to tell you my personal favorite uh, is through storytelling. And this is where my educational background becomes a huge bonus here because I can constantly draw upon my personal stories from my teaching days and come up with strategies that are not just business focused, but also pedagogically focused. So this has allowed me to easily connect with my clients to build that rapport because many of the times uh, solutions engineers are seen as the consultant in the room. So I think having that personal experience as a formal teacher is particularly helpful because I can really understand, I can really empathize with some of these challenges that my clients are facing, which also means that I can propose solutions that address exactly these pain points. Fantastic. Now, how do you see the role of technology in K-12 schools evolving in the next few years? That is an excellent question. So no doubt that the pandemic has triggered all of us to uh, rethink or reevaluate the role of technology in education. I mean, before the pandemic, 
Some of us might have had zero technology implemented in our classrooms. Others may have used some sort of technology to complement our teaching. While we also know schools where uh, they've already had a comprehensive elements in place. But regardless of where we were at before the pandemic, when COVID-19 hit, remote learning became a default. We were all forced to turn to technology so that our kids could have a continued education. So now that we're coming out of the pandemic, we know that the technology out there is just going to keep on evolving. And it's really our job as educators to find the right balance between um, the traditional form of classroom teaching and this so-called new tech-mediated learning experience. And from my experience, we often see different stages in a school's technology adoption journey. Some schools may simply use technology as a direct substitution of physical resources. Um, for example, instead of giving students physical handouts, teachers may upload a PDF to onto the school's LMS, which students can access both in the classroom as well as when they're back at home so that you know, they can learn at their own pace. While some others may look at using technology for more transformative processes, such as engaging students in a more self-directed learning, either through a flipped classroom or a blended approach. Another example I'm gonna give, so students may be given an independent task to research on a, um, on a topic or a project. They can then leverage uh, the myriad of tools out there, such as digital media tools, uh, virtual lab simulations, or even connecting with experts in an online space to engage themselves in real world um, problem solving. They can even take that a step further and then use technology again to demonstrate their understanding, such as, you know, maybe for us, uh, some of us who are more introvert uh, can uh, share our thoughts on an online discussion forum. And some of us who are more expressive maybe uh, might prefer to record a video of themselves summarizing the key takeaways before sharing that with the rest. And I think in this process, technology makes learning more active, more student-centric and more student-led. But really, at the end of the day, it really isn't about um, you know, using the most sophisticated tool, but rather having purposeful use of technology, using the right tool for the right audience in the right manner. Absolutely. Um, in your experience, what was often the biggest challenge to advancing the use of technology in classrooms? The first one I would say is people's mindset. So I've definitely come across teachers who are resistant to change or to adopt technology in their classrooms. And I think a lot of that comes down to uh, the lack of a proper system in place to equip these teachers with the necessary skills to deploy technology. And if we want our teachers to become confident enough to use these tools, if we want to get their buy-in, professional development needs to come first. And the next thing, um, the next point would probably be more pertinent in many of the develop developing markets that I'm working with right now is not having the infrastructure in place to support the proper use of technology. I mean, in my day-to-day -day call with um, some of these clients, I often get questions on the offline capability of our platform because data usage is a huge issue in this market. Now, having fast, reliable and secure Wi-Fi is something we kind of take for granted. But we need to know that the lack of it could actually be a hindrance to the effective use of technology in classrooms. And lastly, I would say cybersecurity. And the reason I bring this up is because um, we used to think these cyber awareness programs are only for um, or only applicable to the elderly. Because our kids grew up in the digital age, so we kind of assume that they are cyber savvy, which in turn means that we don't really have many of such programs in place that are targeted at our youngest age of students. But I do want to say that tech savvy is not equivalent to cyber savvy. And if we want our kids to learn in a safe space, the last thing we want for them is to become a victim to this cybersecurity threats. 
Absolutely, very important. Um, I wanted to ask you, do you have a favourite ed tech resource? Uh, I mean, I work for Instructure, Dave, so I'm probably going to be <laughs> biased here when I say my favourite is Canvas. <laughs> uh, but really, I so when I transitioned to work for Instructure, I wanted to work on a product that I am passionate about, and Canvas is that product. And right from the beginning during my interviews, when I was researching and exploring the platform, and now being the technical expert, I've enjoyed using it a lot. On top of that, I also believe in its course to elevate teaching and learning experiences and to make education more accessible. Because really, education should not be a privilege. Can you give um, viewers and listeners a little bit of context, a little bit um, more info on Canvas itself? Yeah, of course. So Canvas is a learning management system. Uh, I would say it definitely is easily the most open and extensible LMS on the market. So what this means is that besides all of these amazing tools that are native to Canvas that teachers can use to engage their students, uh, they can also pull in over 500 third-party tools that integrate very nicely with Canvas. And from an end user's perspective, this means that you will now have a central place for uh, all of your teaching and learning activities. So instead of having all of your teaching materials scattered across the internet, you now have one central location where you can access them and deliver them effectively to your students. Now, I Ming, mean, um, what is something you're working on now that, uh, that excites you? Well, I will be speaking at Educatech Asia that is happening in Singapore next week. So I've been working on that speech a lot uh, the past weeks or so. It's the first time that I'm going to be speaking at a huge event like this. So I'm really excited about it. So if you are in the vicinity, uh, do come and say hi. So I'll be there and uh, looking forward to that. Um, what much. are some of the, um, the challenges that you've faced transitioning? So let's go back a little bit. Let's, let's look at when you moved from working in classroom to um, working in a more ed tech role or perhaps even transitioning mm -hmm. to your current role. Um, what were some of the challenges you faced during that? That is a very good question. I get asked that a lot, actually, probably because the path I've chosen is a pretty unique one. And I've also spoken to teachers who are just like me a few years back, looking to seek um, challenges outside the classroom. And I think one of the challenges many faced and I have faced as well is not knowing the direction or the path that we would like to go into, what exactly interests me and you know what I'm passionate about. And I think secondly, in kind of relating to the previous point as well, is sometimes teachers undervalue ourselves. So we don't really see how much transferable skills a teacher has. And I think that is just so not true. For a start, teachers are excellent communicators and speakers because not everyone is able to stand in front of a classroom and capture 40 kids' attentions for a good half an hour or 40 minutes but teachers are excellent at that. And secondly, teachers are great problem solvers because we face challenges and concerns all the time, both inside and outside of the classroom. This could range from addressing behavioral issues to developing plans uh, for our struggling students. And this is really just to name a few of the many transferable skills that a teacher has. Um, but building on that, I think valuing these transferable skills of teachers goes both ways. So on the other side of the coin, employers also need to see the values that a teacher can bring to the table. And the last thing I would say is um, the circle of friends or social interactions teachers have um, can sometimes be limited. And I'm not saying this applies to everyone. But it is pretty common uh, to hear teachers saying, you know, that all my friends are teachers because we share the same schedule, the same holidays, and we share the same struggles and same joy at work. And I think that is perfectly fine. But we do need to know the downside of surrounding ourselves only with people in the same profession is that we miss out on opportunities outside our world and we get perspectives that are one dimensional. 
And all these, I think, just add extra inertia to stepping out of this so-called comfort zone. So Ming, uh, what would be some advice you could give to anyone out there thinking of um, making a similar career change? I would say the first one is to really understand yourself, knowing what drives you and where you want to get to. Um, this may take some time. Even It may even take a few interviews for you to realize that you are interested or simply not interested in a job. But I think once you find that passion, you will be attracted to those jobs in those sectors. And because you're passionate about it, you will naturally shine through during the interviews. Secondly, I would say knowing how to sell yourself. Um, this is not just about relating your skills and experience to the job requirement that you're applying for but really articulating what exactly differentiates you from all the other candidates out there. Some may even have more experience in the field than you have. So uh, I gave my personal story just now on how my educational background plays a huge uh, advantage here in my current role. So really, I think it's also about focusing on the positives. So you know, instead of just putting yourself down and saying, oh, I can only teach, Focus on a unique experience that you are bringing to the table uh, that no one else in the room has apart from you. And lastly, expand your network, talk to more people. And really teachers are great at this because our job requires us to be eloquent. I mean, I went to Bad Asia in Bangkok and I met you, Dave, and now we're here on your podcast. So go out and talk to more people. You'll never know where the next conversation takes you to. Very good advice. Now, uh, Ming, how can people connect with you? Uh, the easiest way to reach me is probably through my LinkedIn. I'm always happy to meet new people, have meaningful conversations, or even just a uh, casual chat. Uh, and also, I will, of course, be at Educate Asia next week. So do come and say hi if you're around. Fantastic. Look, looking forward to seeing you there and hopefully uh, some of our viewers and listeners as well. Ming, it's been fantastic to have you on Education Talks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me too, Dave. And see you next week at Edutech. See you then. If you're in Singapore or planning to be there for the Expo at Edutech Asia on November 9 to 10, please let me know. I'd love to catch up with you. If you enjoyed this episode of Education Talks, please do share with your friends and colleagues. Don't forget to stay subscribed to catch each new episode.